Yo, yo, what up, what up? All right, so we're live, we're live again. Um, today's video, anybody brand new coming in, today's video will be a continuation from yesterday's video. So you'll see how the, <clears throat> the topics kind of connect. Um, and then we'll dive into it. I'm going to give you an idea. Hold on, let me drink some water. I'll give you an idea of what we're going to cover for today. Um, I did give everybody an idea in yesterday's video. If you didn't get a chance to get it, get around to um, checking out yesterday's video, feel free to get in there. It's a lot of good material. I got a lot of good feedback to all the subscribers who did happen to leave their comments about that video. You let me know a lot of positive feedback about it, that you liked it, thought the information was very informative. And that's, that's really good. That makes me feel good. It makes me want to do it more. So definitely more to come. Um, kind of, you know, similar videos to, to the one I did yesterday and then more like it will definitely come sometime soon. So as for today, just like I said, we're going to cover uh, um, certain things like our, our vitamins and all that stuff we want to target for the day. But for the most part, what I want to go ahead and tackle right now is just the topics that we're going to um, go over. So hold on, let me double check what's going on here. Pros and cons are two times a day. Um, hold on. I don't think I'm in the right area. Give me one second. All right, cool. So just like, hold on, it just kicked me out. So just like the title says, um, should I do crunches to get rid of um, the belly fat in my stomach area? I mean, you probably heard different avenues, different outlets talk about that. Um, they'll reflect on, you know, their pros and cons. I'm going to give you my feedback, my take on it, my experience with it. And kind of see if it'll help you make sense of it so you could go about following the necessary ways to getting a goal taken care of on your end if it happens to be something related to that um so as far as the crunches uh, we'll talk about that will it make any change in the stomach area will it help you to reduce fat will it build muscle what do you actually really want to do it for so what's the purpose getting down on the floor and actually doing crunches we'll tackle that um the next thing up is going to be can i lose more weight so if you ever want to know if you were to eliminate fat out of your diet would that help you to lose weight outside of not eliminating carbohydrates not eliminating protein not really watching exactly what you eat but just to take fat out of the equation will that help you to lose weight okay we'll talk about that and kind of get you know some pros and cons in that area as well um, another thing I'm going to tackle is, can I hit my goals without the proper water consumption? It's very important that you understand water is a crucial, crucial component to you actually losing weight. And if it's taken out of the equation or you're not able to get enough, what kind of takes place in the body? What could you possibly do to kind of make up for it? We'll kind of talk about that and dive into it. Um, the vitamin of the day, I told you yesterday, is going to be B12. All right, B12, we'll talk about it. Foods that you can find uh, that contain B12. Um, we'll talk about some pros and cons, what it actually does for the body and stuff like that. So that's good info to know. Um, the supplement of the day, we're going to dive into creatine. Creatine is a big one. Um, it'll be creatine monohydrate. All right. There's other creatines on the market that you might want to dive into and learn about as well. But today we're going to cover the monohydrate. All right. Um, and then the exercise of the day, I'm going to see what I could do. Um, I'm probably going to break out the jump squats right behind me. Nothing special. I don't think it's real you know, nothing that you need a lot of space or anything like that. So I'm gonna probably just do it right behind me as far as the exercise of the day goes. So let's get this one started. All right, first things first, crunches. A lot of people think that if they get down and they do a lot of crunches, that is gonna equate to them seeing a more visible six pack or abdominal wall, whatever you wanna call it. I'm going to go ahead and answer the question. I don't beat around the bush. Okay. That is not going to be the case. All right. You cannot get down and do a million crunches and break off with lower body fat unless you actually targeted aiming to reduce your body fat. If you aim to reduce your body fat, that only comes with a caloric deficit. All right. Once you put your body in a caloric deficit, it'll have to tap into your fat stores. Usually that'll equate to fat loss and body fat loss. That's the only way you're going to see the abdominals become more apparent, okay? Now, what is the reasoning for doing crunches? A lot of people will say, well, I mean, I just want to see six-pack abs. If you're telling me that if I break out crunches every day, I'm not going to see those six-pack abs, not necessarily. Not if you're only doing crunches by itself. 
So along with the crunches, what you want to tack on is the diet. Or what are the crunches doing on top of the diet? The crunches is actually going to give you a more firm, tighter midsection. All right. You ever get around for females, you ever go to a guy, you touch the guy anywhere around his midsection and you notice, well, damn, it's it's really firm. It's really tight. It feels, you know, rock hard. That will usually come from doing a lot of crunches, not necessarily just cutting what you eat. The visible side, what you see will come from your diet. So you wanted to see more abdominals. You want to see it more chiseled. That'll come from you actually following a strict diet. When somebody touches at it and you notice that it's really, really hard, that's going to come from the crunches itself. So the idea is to combine both. So the diet's going to give you the more apparent six pack look. And then the crunches is going to give you a stronger, firm, tighter physique around the midsection area. So it does not matter if you break out and you do the side crunches, the side bends. You want to do um, just basic crunches, getting on the floor and doing something to that degree. It's usually going to equate to the exact same thing. All you're going to build is a more firm, stronger core or midsection. But if you want to see it, if you want to see more abdominals, that's going to come from your actual diet. So you need to go about watching what you eat, which ties into yesterday's video. If you're looking to see more of that midsection stubborn belly fat go away, in order to make that happen, you're going to want to follow through with some of the things that I mentioned in yesterday's video, which was a very intense uh, workout when it comes down to it, breaking it down in its exact terms. It's a hit training type of program, something that's going to stimulate the body, push the heart rate above those normal, comfortable areas. That's definitely where you want to be in order to target and trigger that belly fat that's really, really stubborn, okay? It's not going to come from just breaking out a bunch of crunches every day on a day-to-day -day basis, but you will benefit from doing crunches, but it usually is only in the area of the firm, toned, that hard rock feeling that you usually want. So don't neglect the crunches, all right? So overall, Keep them in your um, keep them in your routine, and if you may, if you have it in your routine, be sure to work the upper abs, lower abs, and also keep in mind the sides are important as well. So the sides are called obliques. You might hear about the term oblique crunches. You might hear the term side bends. These are two particular exercises that I favor that really help to build um, the obliques, which are the abdominals on the side. You don't want to neglect any particular area because the way that the core works. So when we're talking about the core, we're talking about below the chest. So you got the pectorals up here and you have your abdominals, your obliques, and then you also have your lower back. The idea behind working your core is to work each individual part. OK, so if you were to get out, get down, do some crunches um, and we're talking about strengthening the core, not just going about visibly seeing the six pack. We're just strengthening the core. You want to make sure you hit the upper abs. Focus on an exercise where you hit the lower abs. Lower abs are usually involved with any exercise that's going to have you raise your knees up towards your chest area. It's usually going to involve the lower abs in order to make that happen. You're also going to want to touch base with some type of side bends. Side bends could be done with something like the hands behind the head, and you can go to one side and then go back over to the next. You can also hold a weight in one hand and practice that same movement, and you'll see it'll become more and more difficult. But the idea is for you to focus on the entire core, all right? The front, the sides, and you want to also consider the back. So something that I like to do when I tie in anything to my leg workouts, it happens to be abdominal work. And the reason why I tie abdominal work in there, because I could easily tackle the lower back, which is usually involved with my deadlifts, which are done on my back days. Um, and then a hyperextension machine, for those not familiar with what that is, it's a machine that you actually get on, you lay, um, you're not laying flat, but you're laying at an angle. In most cases, you cross your arms over your chest and you go down and up. This usually works the lower back area, all right? I find that's best to be done on your leg days because you already have exercises that involve legs that tie into the lower back. So if you just go ahead and work your abdominals on top of legs and tie in your lower back, that's going to be the direction you want to go in when you consider working the core, because when you work your core, it's important to hit the front, the sides and the back. OK, it's very important that your agility and ability to move all around and about 
is at its most or greatest range of motion, all right? You don't wanna be stiff and tight or anything like that. So not only will you wanna involve exercises that work these particular areas, but there's also stretches that can be done that'll also help to elongate the muscles in those areas, get you in a more, um, uh, a more agile state, and it'll help you throughout your exercises. So stretches that are geared towards those particular exercises are good. Quick example, um, something as simple as me just reaching over my head Going over like this gives me the ability to stretch my obliques, which are on the side. Right after I hit an oblique stretch, it makes sense to now do an oblique exercise because I got the muscles nice and elongated, nice and stretched out. And now they're ready to take on any type of exercise that I throw its way. OK, so if that hopefully that makes sense. Um, and that's tackling the question about the crunches and how effective will they be in terms of someone seeing their abdominals more. They don't have that type of an effect. The effect is in the area of the toned hardness that you might feel, but it doesn't necessarily make the abdominals more apparent, okay? It doesn't make it more visible. Uh, planks, um, you're so cool. Thank you so much for the comment. Um, I don't know if it's coming in as a comment or a question. Um, so this is what I've read about and learned um, when it comes down to planks, people have found that planks end up being something that is done on abdominal days or on days that you actually work the core statement. I got you. So um, just keep this in mind. So this is what I've heard, what I've learned over a period of time. They've recently linked planks to not being an exercise that actually contributes or works towards building the strength in your abdominal muscles. Now it works the core as a whole, which I could agree to because when you get down in plank position, you having to hold your body in that um, stable uh, position is gonna involve all of the muscles all throughout your entire body. So it'll definitely involve the core. But as far as like making the abdominal stronger in a sense, or let's say in comparison to what a crunch is gonna deliver, they found that the planks don't really stand a chance. The planks are on the lower end in terms of working on that, particularly as your goal. If you say, man, look, I want some hard abs. I want to make sure when my girl touches my abs, it is as hard as a rock. That is better done with the actual crunches that you do down on the floor or whatever crunches you do on a machine or anything like that. But planks itself has been linked more to you actually um, building your core and your uh, stabilizers, the muscles that keep you stable and in place. So you do get an overall um, improvement or, or benefit. But when we think about like getting those real hard, tight abs, the planks in most research, research and study, the planks have not been the top one to go to um, in that situation. So I would advise doing the planks, but kick them to the very end of your workout, make it more like an accessory type of thing. Um, or if you actually have a goal where you say, look, my goal is to have the strongest core in the world, then definitely incorporate planks all throughout your routine, throughout the week, throughout your workouts, all of that would be a great thing. I like them because they are easy to fit in and also maybe help back muscles too, but not sure. So again, it doesn't necessarily directly help your back muscles, but when you get into a plank position, your body's gonna now work as a whole because you're stabilized. And in one position, your muscles, which is stabilizers, have to come into play in order to keep you up or you would just drop down. So at the end of the day, when you're in that stable position, yes, you're gonna work your back, back muscles to a degree, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that's gonna be your go-to if you were looking to improve the strength in your back muscles the same way that it works in your abdominal muscles. It's just gonna work your core as a whole. If you wanna improve the strength in your back muscles, you wanna find something like a hyperextension machine if you end up in the gym, or if you have the ability to work out at home, you would do something like deadlifts. And deadlifts will usually involve not only all the muscles throughout the entire body, but it really triggers and um, primarily works the lower back, which in a lot of cases could be a good thing because a strong lower back is key when it comes down to you making any type of improvement in your body, your strength, um, body composition change, anything along those lines to your lower back, if it goes, usually everything goes right along with it, you know, because any lower back injuries, most people will tell you stay away from exercise entirely. Um, so 
Uh, that's pretty much how I wanted to tackle the um, that issue with uh, crunches, um, what to actually do in order to see or make your abdominals more apparent, make it more visible, and what should you do and what does it mean to get down and do those crunches? What is it going to bring you? What will it actually uh, equate to? So let's keep it moving. Um, let's touch base on the next topic. I think I'm gonna just go in the order that I have written in, in my notes. And the next thing up is gonna be, oh, this is a good one. Can I lose more weight if I cut fat out of my diet completely? I mean, it's a, it's a question I'm sure a lot of people have. Um, hold on, let me backtrack before I go into that because it seems like you're so cool, has something to say about the crunches. I get what you're saying for sure. My problem is lack of time. I have a very active job and a ton of hours, plus single parent, etc., but still fit in what I can. Loving this channel as well as your other. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks for, for the support on not only this channel and and um, the other channel. The one thing that I say behind what you're telling me on this message, and I don't know your lifestyle exactly in it, you know, all the things that you're going through, but the advice that I would put out to anybody that's in your shoes, which it seems like you have a very active lifestyle. Not only do you have the active lifestyle, single parent, you also mentioned the active job. By having the active job, it's gonna be wearing tear, not only at work, but I'm sure when you get home with being in a single parent situation, you have the wear and tear happening to you there. So overall, it's gonna seem like, almost like in terms of energy, the whole world is coming down on you. You don't have much left to really go out and perform exercises or anything like that. It's very good if you're actually getting out there and doing anything to any degree. But what will end up happening is you must start somewhere, all right? You can't give up and say that there isn't enough time or you don't have enough energy. What will end up being the case in order for you to be most successful is if you actually start in any particular area. So you might say to yourself, um, well, I know I have five minutes. I mean, I even put my wife on something like this. So what she had once upon a time is five or 10 minutes in the day to work out. That's it. She couldn't go to the gym. She just, for all whatever was going on in her life, she felt that she had zero time. So I told her, if you could map out all of your, you know, your priorities, your things like that, how much would you actually have mapped out for some, you have to map out something. All right. If you have to map out something, what would you go with as far as your gym time? She committed to 10 minutes. So I held her accountable for 10 minutes um, daily, because if you did 10 minutes every other day, it might not seem like enough. Now, what can happen within a small fraction of time that you have is if you were to push the intensity high enough, you will still gain a lot of benefit from a 10 minute workout. Um, it is very, very short. So what might be entailed is an extra five, if possible, where you could actually tie in some stretches and straight from the stretches, you would jump right into your workout. Once you get into your workout, you would focus on a high intensity workout. If the intensity is raised to the degree that it needs to be, then you'll definitely see that it is very easy for you to accomplish this 10 minute workout, gain the benefits of whatever you have going on. And over time, you want to slowly add more time if possible. LOL. Do I do have HVAC? So sun up to sun down. So, yep, I do same five, 10 minutes as well. AC season is a butt kicker though. You talk about tired. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I do understand. I do understand. So if you are in them ducks and you're actually crawling through and stuff like that, really getting down, getting busy when it comes down to you know being physical, if you would incorporate five or 10 minutes at a time, what will happen over a period of time is your five and 10 minute workouts will no longer take a toll on your body the same way it did the first time around. So six weeks down the line of you doing 10 minute workouts at a very, very high intensity, at some point in time, your body's desire for more will build and it's gonna start to tell you, you know, it's gonna tell you. If it doesn't tell you physically, like, you know, you do your workout and you're like, I don't really feel nothing, you're gonna be told in on the scale. So when you look at the scale, you might see change in the very beginning, but over a period of time, the change kind of dies down because you need to change something up. You need to make the intensity even higher or you need to add more time to your workout. So that's kind of how you would play things out for the most part. In the beginning, just dedicate the any fraction of time that you can to actually working out. 
after you make that dedication, focus on the type of exercise that you're going to, you know, prioritize during that time. Make sure you spread it out over a good period of time. And when I say that, if you're going to do a 10 minute workout and I focus on a small number so it'll make more sense, a 10 minute workout, what you want to end up um, seeing on your schedule is a daily routine. Because if you're only going to dedicate 10 minutes, then yeah, you need to work out probably every single day. I, even if you are a little sore, I would still push that workout because it's not enough time at the end of the day. But what's going to happen over a period of time is you'll work up to that point where you'll be getting in 15, 20 minutes, the more sufficient amount of time that you need in order to hit your goals. So my advice, the biggest thing that I could say is to just start light, start small. And over a period of time, you should grow and your body will need and desire something a little more extra which you'll be comfortable with doing. Because if I were to tell you right now, yeah, I need you to pull up to the gym. We're going to go ahead and get in this 40, 50 minute workout right after you've been juggling kids and also dealing with work. It's not going to seem highly likely that your performance is going to be where it needs to be. So start light and work your way all the way up. I understand your body gets used to it. Yep. You got it. So that's, that's hopefully that helps build not only your understanding, but anybody else that ends up stumbling on the stream this definitely helps just by starting light. I think that's always the route to go to kind of get yourself um, on the right boat really fast, you know, and just keep up the, the same work up until your body can can actually go. 5 a.m. 5 a.m. workout, here I come. <laughs> Yo, you know it. You know, it only got to be a small fraction of time. And then eventually, like I said, your body will desire and you mentally will want something more, something extra. And that's key and actually making any type of progress in your workout routines. It's a lifestyle change. So with that in mind, you can't really consider going zero to 100 overnight. You got to take it slow, take it easy, because you're going to be doing it for the next 40, 50 years. So take your time while doing it. All right. So I'm going to move on to the next question. Um, so can I see... Or can I lose more weight if I cut fat out of my diet completely? So what I like to do with these questions is I like to just answer them immediately. So y'all don't wait around or wonder what, where the answer is. Um, so if you take fat out of your diet completely, can you can you lose weight or can you lose more weight? Uh, the answer is yes and no. The reason why the answer is yes and no, because if fat is not contained in your diet, if you have a diet that contains zero fat, all right. Number one, yes, you will lose weight or you may not lose weight. It all depends on the caloric deficit. If you end up in a caloric deficit, your chances of losing weight are much higher. Now, you could be in a caloric deficit with or without fat. Does that make sense? You don't actually need fat to be present in order to be in a caloric deficit. You could actually take fat out and still be in a caloric deficit. So with or without, you're going to lose weight. The whole thing is how do you actually make your body lose weight? and make it lose weight at its fastest uh, pace. You know, you wanted to lose weight as fast as possible. You don't want to stagger and have your results slow down and stuff like that. So when fat is taken out of the diet, believe it or not, you will possibly slow the process of your weight loss down. And how does that actually happen? Because your body seeks a balanced meal, a balanced diet, okay? Uh, you're so cool. I'm going to get to it in a second. So your body seeks a balanced diet. All right. So your body desires carbohydrates. It desires fat and it desires protein in order to make body composition change take place. It's a more or less type of thing, depending on what your percentages are, you know, more or less on your protein or your carbs and your goal. That's going to reflect how much you actually include. But for the most part, the body wants all three. All right. All three macronutrients need to be contained in all of your meals when they're not present. The body does react a little differently. It doesn't really like when it doesn't see all three macronutrients, but it'll make do with whatever it, it has to work with. So if you manage to only bring in carbohydrates and you manage to only bring in protein, then, hey, your body's going to say, yeah, we'll work with this. But at the end of the day, what we desire and what will help you make more change is if all three macronutrients are included every single time you sit down and eat. OK, so the answer to the question is yes and no. OK. If you include fat or don't include fat, doesn't really matter. If you're going to lose weight, it's going to be a reflection of if you're in the caloric deficit or not. All right. That's what tells if you lose weight or not. Now, can you lose more weight by eliminating fat? 
That may not be the case because, again, what your body desires are the three macronutrients. And if you include exactly the amount of fat that it wants and desires, the chances of you losing more weight is a lot higher, which in different cases will be for different people. Somebody might only require X amount of grams of fat along with their carbohydrates and protein throughout the day in order to achieve the most weight loss. Some people might only need X amount, but to eliminate it entirely, it could give you good results momentarily. Some people might even last long, like, hey, yo, I've been going six, seven weeks now and I'm still knocking off the pounds and I don't have fat included in my diet. That's great. But what we're looking for is this a lifestyle change. So if we're going to practice this for the rest of our life, we want to make sure our results are continuously seen all throughout our journey. So if we're going to get to a point where we're not going to see results anymore, that might not be the direction we want to go in. We want to continuously see the results come in time and time again. And that'll usually happen when you give the body exactly what it desires, which are your three macronutrients, your fat, your carbs, and your protein. Just make sure you monitor the amounts and usually the amounts will change along with the time of day and or your level of activity, wherever it ends up in that little spectrum. Because, you know, throughout the day, um, depending on how many calories you consume, as you get closer to your workouts, you may decide to consume more or less. All right. That's a complete um, decision of what you have going on and what your goals are. So to everybody's point, to everybody's answer. Um, answering the question, it's a yes and no thing, okay? Yes and no, because um, whether you have fat included inside your diet or whether you don't, if you're going to lose weight, that'll be told based on how many um, calories you are below um, your BMR, which is a basal metabolic rate, the amount of calories that are required for you to maintain your weight, okay? If that, hopefully that makes sense. Um, I'm ready to move on to the next question. And I believe it's the water question, which I think is a good one. So this one right here says, um, can I hit my goals without proper water consumption? So I, I was very specific with how I set up the question. If you notice exactly how I put the question, um, it says, can I hit my goals without the proper water consumption? So if you go to the doctor right now, he's going to give you an amount of water that you probably want to consume normally on a day-to-day -day basis. This is usually without exercise. Once you include exercise, you could definitely count on taking in more water because when you exercise, you lose water. So, you know, water in the water out, you usually want to make sure you're bringing in more than you're actually losing. So when we think about the water consumption and will you actually hit your goals, the answer is yes. Without the proper water consumption, Yes, you can still hit your goals, okay? So doctor said, I need you to get 64 ounces of water, which is like eight glasses. Um, it is eight ounces in every cup. They want you to have eight cups. So if you were to consume less than what the doctor requires, if you look online, what they'll say as far as your daily water intake, they'll advise you to take in eight glasses. Usually it equates to 64 ounces of water. If you were to take in less than that, can you successfully hit your goals? The answer is yes. OK, now, do is that what I advise as a trainer? Nah, I advise making it easy on your body by consuming enough water so your body doesn't have to reach the extra mile in order to gain or obtain the water that it needs. And one thing that can actually happen if there's not enough water consumed is your body's going to begin to extract water from the foods that you actually take in. So with that being said, that's a different way of your body getting the water. But if you were to supply your body with enough water, just manually drinking, it might not really have to reach out on that limb all of the time. Now, there are particular foods that you can target that will actually have the water, more and less water contained. We'll talk about that in a second. Let me uh, talk. see what these uh, comments say before I go any further. Um, 5 a.m. workout here. I come. I'm up at 5:30 every day. Anyway, um, to whoever asked that question, I had a ton of results by cutting out as much sugar as possible. Hope that helps with who asked that about fat. Yeah. All right. Oh, I got this in the way. Hello, just got here. Helping son with geometry. It sucks. <laughs> 
Ah, uh, that's cool. I got I got that coming on the way. It's actually Friday, so I might do my homework or do the homework with my son. Um, he likes it Sunday Sunday morning. It's his thing, so we might get it in on Sunday morning. We'll have some some stuff to tackle too. But getting into the foods, I want to say I had it here. Let me double check. All right, yeah, so I have it right here. So what I ended up looking up is they have 10 water-rich foods that help you stay hydrated. So the way that it works with the water, like I said, um, if you're asking, hey, am I, am I able to still hit my goals without the proper water consumption? I told you yes. And that's mainly backed up behind the fact that your body is going to take water from wherever it needs in order to get the job done. And if it happens to reach in the direction of foods, right here I have... Um, some foods that are actually higher on the water percentage. And the first one at the top is cucumbers, right at 96% water, tomatoes at 95%, spinach, 93, broccoli, 90, Brussels sprouts, 88, oranges at 86, apples at 85. And then the list goes on a little longer, but you're getting the idea that the answer to my question is actually yes. If you did not end up consuming Doctor told you consume 64 ounces of water or eight glasses, and you didn't get around to actually consuming that amount exactly, can you still hit your goals? What I feel is usually the case from my experience and what I've experienced with my clients is that your goals might take a little longer to get to. Without supplying your body with enough water can only lead to your body stressing out to some degree and having to reach in all these other directions and go down different avenues in order to bring in the necessary amounts. If you were to bring in all of the amounts that your body desires, you'll see that you will fill out, you'll look better, you'll perform better, usually in, you know, when you work out and stuff like that. And that all ties in with the high water intake. So that's always the direction that I would go in. But for whatever reason, everybody has their situations. For whatever reason, the point that I'm making in this video why I brought up this question is that if you ever are in a, if ever are in a situation where you feel like, yo, you cannot get enough water on your daily, in your daily routine, um, or you drink a lot of water, but you end up sweating it all out. Will you end up still achieving your goals and getting to that point? The answer is yes. But keep, also keep in mind that as your water intake stays on the lower end, if you get in a gym and you decide to perform, your chances of injury end up increasing much higher than those who have the necessary amounts of water already in their body. All right. So it's very important. I would advise Get in all the water that you can. You will have your days. You just don't consume a lot. Um, one thing you will find is if you drink alcohol or anything like that, one of the number one things that I advise along with drinking alcohol, feel free to do so. But along with it, something that you want to include is your water intake, whether it come during your drinks, which I've seen people do before. You can actually take in your water after you drink, let's say the next morning sometime during that drinking time and the next 12 to 24 hours, you're going to want to make sure your water consumption or water intake starts to really pick up because the number one thing that the alcohol will zap in your body is your water. And once it dehydrates you, it really impairs your body and makes it harder for your body to really burn fat and build muscle. Because it's one thing when you put something in your body that's taking out the water, it's like it's sucking it out. And then it's something different when you just don't get enough. When you don't get enough, your body says, all right, cool, we'll maintain, we'll hold down whatever we have at the moment. And in the moment we get an opportunity, we'll go ahead and pull more in. But as your body sits at some point where it's good, it's cool, when the, when the alcohol comes in and it starts to pull you lower into a more negative point, that's definitely where your body does not like it. You will feel and see it in your results when your uh, water uh, intake ends up getting to the lower end and then your hydration overall in your body ends up hitting that lower point. They do have scales that are sold. Um, you could get some as cheap as like $19.99 at, at um, some of your local stores and stuff like that, or you could get it online. Um, you'll find that when you order these scales, one of the ties and connections that they always have along with body fat, weight, and muscle mass is they always like to give you an idea of your hydration because that's a critical piece of information to know when it comes down to you achieving any one of your goals, whether you're looking to increase weight or decrease weight, is better done with a high water intake, usually an amount that's far above the amount that you usually need 
on a day-to-day -day basis. Again, if you were to do any type of exercise, especially if it's strenuous and extensive, you need to make sure your water intake is above and beyond that normal level because your chances of injury end up being higher and your chances of not seeing the results that you're looking for starts to diminish as the time plays out. All right, so that's my whole take on um, uh, the water, water consumption and how you need to go about handling it and can you actually hit your goals if it doesn't happen to be all the way up to this to, to the um, amount that you need you know in order to make the results happen a lot faster or easier on your body um, so you have an idea of some foods now you have an idea of what you can do um, can't consume water whatever maybe you're in a position where you just can't drink it um, you're in the middle of a courtroom going through a court case you can't just break out the jug of water and start downing it you can't even actually go out to the bathroom like you want to you know like you want to um so in that scenario whatever need um or whatever you can do in order to get you through that situation you might end up where you could just break out some food or fruit something like that and kind of be able to kind of you know get your hydration levels a little higher with um foods um so let's see I'm gonna go on to the next thing. So let's see, hold on, let me uh, let me see what I got. I got people texting me. So moving on to the next thing, um, I went ahead and said, I'm gonna talk about vitamin B12, all right? So we're now off of the questions. Well, let me actually go in and make sure nobody has anything else to say. Andrea, thank you so much for coming. Um, and everybody else, thank you so much for coming. If anybody feels the need that you have any questions about what I'm saying, feel free to drop it in on the comment section and I will make sure I answer everybody's question. There's not much traffic on this channel, so things like that are very easy to do. So any and every question can be answered as this channel is as small as it is, but you know when it grows, it's gonna be harder to get that word out because it's harder to see so much information or comments coming in. So let's talk about B12. All right. Again, I think I said it in a previous video. Um, you're going to find B12 and B6 usually coming in at the same time. And usually when you see those two particular um, uh, vitamins, they're usually tied into energy drinks or B12 has been tied into a shot that's given that usually helps with energy. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to talk a little bit about um, some stuff. And we're gonna talk about what is it good for? Um, number one, I'm gonna just read it straight off of Google right here. Um, it's basically saying vitamin B12 is a nutrient that helps keep the body's nerve and blood cells healthy and helps make DNA the genetic material in all cells. So very, very critical just off that first sentence right there. Vitamin B12 also helps prevent a type of anemia called megaloblastic anemia that makes people tired and weak. So you hear where the time connection is to energy and how it can help with that um, supplementation. Um, the next thing it says is um, the two steps are required. This says that there's two steps that are required for the body to absorb B12 from food. So that's the other thing is I also wanted to touch base with uh, what foods are high in B12, all right? So it basically says to increase the amount of B12 in your diet, eat more foods that contain it, such as beef, liver, and chicken, fish and self shellfish, such as trout, salmon, tuna fish, and clams, uh, fortified breakfast cereal, low fat milk, yogurt, and cheese, and eggs. So you see that it's, I mean, I know, I know my diet at least, I come across these foods all the time. So I don't really feel that I'm B12 deficient. I see these foods several times throughout the day, eggs, fish, milk, chicken. So I don't necessarily feel that I need to actually supplement B12. But if I did, um, yeah, that's, if I did feel the need, then yeah, you could go to your, your local uh, vitamin shop or order it online and go about getting it like that. Um, again, what you see is tied into it is it does contribute and help with energy. So if you do feel that your energy levels are along the lower end and you found that you don't really like to drink coffee or you found that you don't really like the Red Bulls and the caffeinated beverages, people have said that B12 shots, not saying that you want to go that route, maybe you just want to supplement it with a pill. Um, B12 in general has been linked to giving the body some extra energy. So depending on how you want to supplement it, whether it be through a shot or a pill or through an energy drink, 
you could go about all the necessary ways and see and check if it makes a difference on how you feel. If it does, then feel free to continue using it and take it in in whatever form you feel most comfortable. If it doesn't work for you, then look, just fall back on it and say, hey, look, I'll probably go a different route, maybe something else that contains B12 and B6 and also caffeine, which is what's found in most caffeinated beverages. It usually comes with the three components, not necessarily just the one. So keep that in mind. If you were to take B12 by itself and say, man, I don't really feel any energy. In most cases, when it ties into energy drinks, you'll see B6 and you'll see the caffeine that usually works in sync. All right. They all work together. So that gives you an idea of where the foods are. All right. Well, foods contain um, B12. Very, very important to know. Again, it's tied in with those energy drinks. Look at the labels. You'll see behind your Red Bulls. Matter of fact, I have one right in front of me right here. Um, you can see right here it has B12. Um, the B12 on this Red Bull is 120%. All right. The B6 on this Red Bull is 350%. Um, the Amount of milligrams of caffeine in 12 ounces of Red Bull, I want to say it's above 100, um, but I'm not sure of the amount exactly. I want to say that the eight ounces of Red Bull has around 80 something milligrams of caffeine. So somewhere around about a cup of coffee, because most cups of coffee, they say have 100 milligrams of caffeine. That's the way to kind of look at it. So you'll see that that's the tie in connection. B6, B12, caffeine is usually um, thrown in together in order to produce or help the body produce the most amount of energy. And that's the combination you'll find in most energy drinks. All right. Um, let's keep it moving. I think, let me see. I got it all in my notes. I think I'm gonna just go ahead into the next thing, uh, which is going to be creatine. All right. Creatine, creatine, creatine. We want to keep in mind that creatine is going to be very useful for males and females. Um, depending on what your goal actually is, you may find creatine to be a helpful thing. You may find creatine to not necessarily work against you. Um, the only time you may find creatine working against you is if you were to have um, something that's weight sensitive. Weight sensitive means if I was a wrestler and I was going to go out to a meet, usually when they go and they do their meets, um, they have to weigh a certain weight. And in certain cases, they may not be the weight that they want to be. And they might find that um, if they were to get out there, sweat it all out, you know what I'm saying? Um, not taking any water, just kind of pee it all out. That'll usually help them bring their weight down to the amount that they want so they could go ahead and compete in whatever they're competing for. So I've found creatine to only work against me in that case, in that situation. But the overall result, as far as what creatine is supposed to do for you, as far as giving you strength, um, helping you with stamina, endurance, helping improve your overall muscle gains, recovery, things like that. Looking at creatine for that itself, it'll do that for male and female. Now, I told y'all in past videos, you want to focus on building muscle. Whether you're male or female, you want to focus on building muscle. It's critical. And you usually get into your goals, okay? If you want to get down to a lower weight, I advise building muscle in combination with cardiovascular activity. If you want to get down to, um, uh, if you want to build a certain amount of muscle, I would advise the same, you know what I'm saying? The same thing. You want to take, make sure you involve and cre keep creatine in your routine unless it works against you in any way, shape or form. In most cases, the benefits that it has on the body, it will not work against you. Um, if you are hung up on weight as a female, I would say to watch the creatine because what you will find with creatine is it will cause weight gain. Now, when I say weight gain, that is exactly what it is. When I say weight gain, that is exactly what I mean. I don't necessarily mean fat gain. Okay. You don't take creatine and you actually start building more body fat. When I say weight gain, usually it's in the area of water. All right. When you take creatine, what it'll help your body to do is your muscles can actually hold on to more water. Now, somebody might say, well, that, that might not be the greatest thing. Well, again, if you have a competition, if you have something weight sensitive that you need to get to and you don't want to be a certain weight, the creatine could throw that off a little bit. But if you're not involved or caring about that and you want the benefits from the creatine, you're going to find that it'll actually help to keep some of the water inside of your muscles, which ends up being a good thing. It'll end up being a case where your body's ability to recover, your body's ability to perform by having water present 
readily available, it'll actually give your body the ability to do that on a on a uh, on a better term platform level. I'm looking for a word, but I can't find it. But it puts your body in a better position to make those things actually happen. Okay. And that's something that you want to keep in mind because you don't want to stray away from your goal and what you really want to happen. You're thinking, yeah, I want weight to come down. I want weight to come down, but don't be misled by the scale and what it's telling you because the benefits that you can actually gain from actually having um, the creatine in your routine is, is, is great. It's, it's, I mean, it would actually take you to try it out, run an experiment for six to eight weeks and then come back and say, hey, look, I noticed the creatine didn't have any benefit for me. And that could always be the case because I can't really tell how anybody's body is going to operate from me being all the way on the other side of the world or wherever I'm at in comparison to where they are. I can't really call it. It'll only make sense if you get out, try some of the things that I advise, ride it out for six to eight weeks. And after a good period of time, after you've experimented with what I advise, if it works for you, then keep it going. If it doesn't work for you, then fall back on it. Come back to me and say, is there anything else you would advise? Because this that you told me here, it actually didn't work for me. And I might ask you different questions about how you went about doing it to see if it was done the right way before you actually announce anything that I'm advising for you. Um, Dorothy says, I do the B12 shots and patches. And I said this before, Dorothy, if you actually feel that the B12 um, shots and or patches works in your favor and you feel like, yeah, you know, every time I take these or every time I do my patches, I feel more energy, then feel free to go about continue uh, continuously using it in order to, you know, get you to wherever you want to be in terms of your energy levels. But if it doesn't work for you, then, yeah, feel free to not use it or try to find a different source to obtain energy um, outside of that, because th there are different ways that you could, you know, kind of practice and um, gain energy. Everybody, thank you, thank you so much for coming. Let's move on. Um, I think I said everything for the most part with that. I'll double check. And I'm actually looking at this, it's the wrong thing. All right, so so the creatine, yeah, so long story short, male or female, go out and get your creatine. Don't be afraid of the extra weight gain that'll actually be tacked on to the creatine. And when I say weight gain, the weight gain will usually fluctuate anywhere between two and five pounds. If you notice more weight gain after taking the creatine, be sure to monitor your hydration levels, be sure to monitor your muscle mass, and not let the weight gain be confused with body fat. All right. It's very important that you monitor those things. I always advise people don't go out and get those basic scales that only tell you your weight. Because if you only look that weight, you'll be missing out on so many things that will help you to hit your goals. It won't ever really make sense at the end of the day. Because when you get on the scale and you see your weight go down, if you lost muscle mass and you lost hydration or water, and your body fat stayed the same, then that decrease in weight is not the best thing. So you need to make sure that you go about handling you know, your scale um, and make sure that it is a scale that tells body fat, weight, hydration, muscle mass, and anything else that they actually um, have going on with the scale. Mine will actually tell you like your metabolic age, which I thought was a really important thing because knowing someone's metabolic age gives you an idea of how fast their metabolism is actually running or working. Because for me, I know when I'm in my best, best, best shape, my scale will actually tell me that I have the metabolism of a 12 year old, which is really, really good. And at the end of the day, if I seen that my metabolism was of a 50 year old man or a 60 year old man, I would immediately know how to tackle my next workout or how to tackle my next eating regimen because of what those results are actually telling me. But if I just looked at the weight, it won't necessarily tell me all of that. It just tells me a half story if you want to kind of look at it like that. So um, I think that's it as far as like the creatine goes. So the next thing I wanted to get into is the exercise of the day. So I noticed that when I covered the exercise of the day, uh, day before yesterday, I covered burpees. I did not explain the importance of burpees when and where it could be incorporated in your schedule and the benefits of burpees, all right? 
Um, so I want to go ahead and tackle that really, really fast. I'm going to fly right through it. If you did not see the burpees review, check two videos back and you'll see it's doing with me standing in the kitchen over my stove because I was making a Caesar salad. So when it comes down to the importance of burpees, I explain the importance of burpees to be um, something that you, it's, it's basically important because you want to do burpees because it'll help with stamina, endurance, agility, and strength. All right. The benefit, the benefit is going to be the muscles. All right. The muscles in your chest actually get worked, which are AKA your pectoral muscles, your shoulders, your triceps, and also your legs. If you notice what a burpee actually is, is it's two exercises in one. At the very beginning of the exercise, you're usually in a uh, squatting position, which you go down to a push up. You push up from the push up, and then you're now in a squatting position, and usually you will finish out the exercise with a jump. After you jump, you now incorporated the legs, which equates to a squat. So you now actually combined a squatting action and a push-up action, which will not only work your pectoral muscles, chest is what that is, your shoulders, aka your deltoids, but it's also going to work your leg muscles. When we talk legs, we're talking about the overall leg because this is a squat. It's always going to involve the overall leg as a full package. So we're talking quadriceps, the muscles on the front of the leg, the hamstrings, muscles on the back of the leg also ties into the calves. So everything is worked during your jump squat. All right. It also ties into the um, push up. So it's an overall total body workout when you when you look at a burpee and what type of benefit it actually has for the body. The importance is what it will actually do. Again, stamina, endurance, agility. And the most important thing at the very end of the day is the explosiveness that you usually achieve during a burpee. Notice that burpees can't be done without the explosion. You need to explode up into your squatting position. When you take off and do your jump squat, that's also considered an explosion. When we talk about explosive exercises, those are the ones that usually lead to the reduction of the belly fat that we really try to tap into all the time. So if you find yourself doing a lot of burpees, at the end of the day, the more burpees you do, the more explosive you get during your exercises, the more that'll equate to you reducing uh, more body fat in your, uh, in your body overall. So getting off the topic of burpees and moving on to today's exercise. Today's exercise kind of almost taps into exactly what those burpees are because we're only going to touch base with what was considered to be half of a burpee, which is just a jump squat. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to step right behind me and I'm going to show you exactly how you want to line up, how you want to set up and what you want to try to achieve when doing an actual jump squat. Y'all don't forget to hit that like button. I see a lot of people coming in the building and leaving out. Please, please, y'all don't forget to hit the like button, all right? Um, let's dive into this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually get up, and I was actually going out ready to do my thing. So I'm in my regular clothes or whatever, um, and, but I could still get in my little squats or whatever and, and, and show y'all exactly how it's done. So hopefully I have enough space over here, and, and what I'm going to do is this. So check this out. So when the squat is actually done, the most you want to do is get down as low as possible. And this is a big thing that I notice a lot of people, they fail to understand is that it does not matter how low you get down into your squat. The idea is to get lower and lower each time. Okay. Everyone will have a different range of motion. Some people can get all the way down to the ground, you know, where their, their butt touches their calves. And some people just can't get that low. They get about a quarter of the way. If that happens to be the case where you can only get a quarter of the way, then so be it. What you want to happen over time is you want to focus on flexibility. In order to increase your range of motion, not only do you need to perform the same exercise again and again and again, not only with your body weight, but you could also practice with load or with weight, you're going to also want to focus on stretches. By doing particular stretches that will help to increase the flexibility in your hamstrings and your quadriceps and all throughout the legs, usually that will help the body at the end of the day be able to go down into a deeper range of motion without you really hurting in your knees or your ankles or anything going wrong. So the idea, if your range of motion is only a quarter of the way during your squat, what you want to focus on is increasing your flexibility and continuously doing the same exact movement over a period of time, which at the end of the day, that'll eventually equate to you going lower and lower and lower each time. As long as you make that your goal, you want to make, you know, Put in some effort to go in a little lower every time you set up and do your workouts. So going lower doesn't necessarily mean that's done on a rep repetition basis. 
this is not rep by rep basis. Going lower and lower each time on your squat could actually be something that's done over a week's period of time. So on Monday, I'm going down a quarter of the way. And then I find myself working out my legs again on Friday, but I'm noticing that I'm able to go down a little further than that quarter mark. And that's the idea that you want to set up with. So at the end of the day, you will eventually achieve going lower and it's easier done if you accomplish focusing on the same exact particular exercises in combination with a good stretching routine that stretches out the muscles in that area. Let's get into this. So when we talk about jump squats, all right, I'm gonna show you a modified version and I'm gonna show you the actual version that I want you to see and focus on. So when I'm talking about squats, I'm actually gonna get down, usually I like my hands in front and I'm just gonna squat down and come back up. Let me kind of drop the camera just a little bit so you can see more of the feet. All right, so I'm gonna drop down just like this and then I'm gonna come back up. When you're in the clear, what most people would consider to be in the clear, and this is as low as I could go, so not even I could go as low as some people out there, but when you're considered to be in the clear is when you actually drop to where your knee to ankle is a straight shot and your knee up to your head is a straight shot. That's considered to be the 90 degree. That 90 degree right there is the safe zone that most people are consider you're working with the most range of motion. If you're looking to work your muscles out, if you want the most benefit from your exercise, you're going to focus on your greatest range of motion. So yeah, you want to keep it in your routine to focus on the stretches and focus on the same movements. And over time, make sure your range increases so you actually gain that benefit from the exercise by going over a more broader range of motion. So the idea right here, and I'm showing you the side shot, um, just so you can see my legs and stuff like that and how low it actually goes. Again, that 90 degree, that's your safe zone. If you can only get down this much, then you're good. You're good. What you're going to focus on is somewhere around 20, maybe 25 reps, just working with that range of motion. Now, this is a modified squat. What I want y'all to actually see is that what I have in the description or what I'm gonna have in the description when I set it up is the idea is a jump squat, all right? Jump squats are far more advanced when it comes down to actual squats in comparison to jump squats. Jump squats actually take you to a different level. Not only is it explosive, which involves a lot on the body, but it becomes a lot on your cardiovascular system. If you were to do enough jump squats, what you're gonna find that over a 30 second time frame, if I have you just break out as many jump squats as you can, you're going to find that if you're not in the greatest shape after about 30 seconds of jump squats, you're probably going to be panting, out of breath, and not really having the ability to move on even to the next exercise. So at the end of the day, when it comes down to it, the jump squats is something you really want to focus on in order to, to reduce body fat, really get your body's heart rate up to where it needs to be, especially if you want to trigger and target the body fat. So let's look at it from the frontal shot. So you can see I'm set up right here. Um, sorry for the amount of space that I'm working with, but I'm going to try and get in the best view that I can actually see. But the main goal, I mean, you can see my body's upright. So the main goal is for you to actually focus on the legs. All right. You notice that my legs in position, as far as feet, you want them about a little bit outside of shoulder width apart. All right. So you don't want to be up tight like this. You want to make sure you right outside of shoulder width apart. Again, I like my hands in front and this is a modified, a basic squat. We're going down and we're going up. We going down and we going up. You bring it down to that 90 and then boom, you go back up. When it comes down to a jump squat, all you need to do is get this high up off the ground. All right? I'm not asking you to touch the ceiling. I'm not asking you to try and touch the rim. We're not doing that. All you need to do is get this high up off the ground. So you probably could be working with a good bit of weight. You know what I'm saying? You're just looking around like, damn, I, don't, I couldn't imagine myself really jumping up and down. I got a lot of weight to work with. That's cool because, again, I need you to get up off the ground at probably about this height. Now, if you could get any higher, that's the, the more the better. Hopefully, over time, you'll work your way up. But in the beginning, just to get you started, we got to be easy on the joints. We got to be easy on the ligaments, the tendons. And what I'm going to get you to know and understand, what this exercise is called or considered is plyometrics. Plyometrics is when the body is involved with any exercise where the body leaves the ground, okay? So your jumping jacks, your jump squats, your burpees, your jump lunges, all of this is gonna be considered plyometrics. So when you're doing this, when I'm ready to do my jump squats, it looks just like this, bro. Hands clasped just like this. I'm actually go down in my 90 degree and I'm gonna come back up and boom, I'm gonna take off and I'm gonna just jump, boom. 
And I'm being nice to the neighbors because the neighbors are downstairs, right? So the point that I'm making here is it doesn't require that much effort. Now, if I'm putting in effort, you're going to see me doing something like this, really getting up. Now, you could do that, but that's not really what's required. All I would expect from my client, especially first time around, your joints, your ligaments can't really bear that impact. But believe it or not, plyometrics, you can look it up. It's all in writing. Plyometrics actually strengthens the joints. It strengthens the ligaments. And believe it or not, taking your ligaments and joints through a stressful period where you actually have that impact is actually beneficial. But it's all about how you do it. Because at the end of the day, the one thing that I want you to focus on is during a jump squat, every time you land, it is important that when you land, you make sure you drop into it. All right, let me back this up real fast so you see what I'm saying. So when I'm in this position, right, I'm going to drop down and I'm going to do my jump squat. Every time I land, the moment my feet hit the ground, immediately bend those knees. Because at the end of the day, your knees are kind of like springs, right? And the last thing you want is for you to do a crash. So what a crash looks like, man, I'm up and down. Check this out. What a crash looks like is this. If I were to do a squat, boom. I actually touched the ground. I hit the ground, but I kept my knees and legs fully extended. You keep your legs fully extended, you're going to, you're going to crash. That's very hard on the joints, hard on the ligaments, hard on the tendons. It's easier done. And the moment your feet touch that floor, bend the knees. Immediately bend the knees so you absorb your fall. And it'll be a lot easier on your joints instead of you having to really deal with, you know what I'm saying? Like that crash is just going to tear up your joints and you're not going to get the benefit from the actual plyometric exercise, which there's a lot of benefits. Like I said, stamina, endurance. If you're looking to reduce body fat, yo, this is where it's at. I'm telling you right now, this, this is the way that you want to go about handling, reducing your body fat to the fullest degree if, if, um, if you actually do these exercises. You'll see this is how it all plays out. But listen, I think that's going to really sum up uh, what I wanted to cover for the most part. I don't know if I'm going to check back in this weekend with a fitness video. I'm, I'm thinking about it. I'm going to consider it. I'm going to see what type of time I'm working with and stuff like that. But I'm going to definitely see y'all on Monday. So, you know, I try to keep it, you know, 100% this week where I came in every single day. I think I accomplished that. And if I didn't, I think I missed one day. So I'm going to make sure that I'm going to start running this Monday through Friday every single day. I'm going to fill y'all in with some fitness advice, um, whether it be just my advice in general that I'm coming up with, you know, to put out to the people. Or if y'all have questions, I'm going to take those same questions and put them in on the live stream, just like you see going on today. And hopefully not only do I help inform the person that asked the question, but anybody else that kind of thought of, thought of the same question, I could actually help them you know, build an understanding as well. All right. So let me double check the chat and um, let me see what's going on. And then I'm going to get ready to tap out. Hopefully I got a good one right before we um, we get ready to roll into this weekend and everybody start cheating. <laughs> yeah. Let me see. Give some love and hit the like. Yeah. Y'all please hit that like button. Please, please, please. I do the B12 shots. All right. So Dorothy said, ECG, some love, hit the like button. All right, cool. So, yeah, I'm going to keep it going. We'll keep it going. The other day, I had the most people in the in this stream. On the, I had 12 people on my live, on the, the, the fitness live. So that was good. That's that's a lot of motivation. You know what I mean? But um, thank you all, y'all, for coming out. I'm going to just go ahead and, you know, um, Keep y'all tuned in. Keep everything locked. You know, I think I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to have a little cooking joint going on probably next Monday. Or I'm going to probably just set it up for every Tuesday. Same way I did it last Tuesday. I'm going to figure it out. But over time, we're going to have a nice structured routine with segments. We're going to learn a lot. And, you know, over time, I'm telling you, knowledge is key. So if you're considering losing any type of weight in order to make that happen, it's, it's easier done when you actually know exactly what you're doing. But let me get up off this one. Thank you so much for everybody for coming out. Um, if you wish to drop any type of um, donations, please get into this video later today in the description. Or if you wish to shoot me out any donations, um, 
Later today, I'm gonna have it in the description below. If you wanna get in right now, feel free to get into a previous video because um, my previous videos already have it up and running. I gotta get ready to make some moves with kids and wifey right now. We're gonna um, go out to eat and we'll see what's going on. Um, but other than that, thank you so much for everybody that came out. I'm gonna get up off this one. Y'all hold it down. CG, I'm out.